nor students. How are we tonight? Well, if we have not met again, I am Jara Ramos. I'm one of the leaders here for the ninth grade girls. Shout out to them. And I have loved this series we've been in, Extravagant Generosity. Um, I just love seeing you guys get creative in your small groups and just coming up with ways to raise money for Wellstead. Uh, it's been really great seeing that. And as we've been in this series, it's made me think of a commercial that I actually used to see when I was younger, probably younger than you all in elementary school. I actually asked a lot of your leaders and they didn't even know the commercial I was talking about. But it's made me think of this commercial and I actually wanna show you guys this, so check out this video. Okay, Josh, do your stuff. Okay, people, you know the drill. Cat boots only, guys. Sometimes you gotta live what you believe up in your arms, cause that's where it's from. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. So that's just a small little commercial, little video that I wanted to show you all. Um, it just got me thinking, this commercial always stuck with me because I just always thought that it was so amazing that these kids got together, got these canned foods, and made a big difference in a shelter, at a shelter it made a big difference in that. And tonight, I wanna to talk to you about how we can be generous with our talents and when we have something small, how we can be generous with it and grow it and make it bigger. So the first thing I wanna do is give you the definition of talent. It'll be up on the screen. I hope you're taking notes and you can follow along. So talent is the unique abilities, skills, and gifts that God has given to us. Our talents are not meant to be hidden or wasted. They play a vital role in fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. As we use and multiply our talents, we become active participants in God's plan to bless others and advance his kingdom. We have to use talents we have, even the ones we don't think we are naturally good at. And that kind of leads into, uh, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 25, but I wanna give you guys some context first on what's going on in this chapter. So this is actually called the parable of the talents. And talent in the Bible actually could transfer over to mean money. So it's the parable of the talents. And a parable in the Bible was an illustration that Jesus gave to kind of teach a lesson. And sometimes the stories may have happened, but sometimes they might, might not have happened. And this specific parable is an illustration of three servants who have a master. And their master's actually going off on a trip. And he gives them some talents or silver. And so he gives one servant five bags of silver, he gives another two bags of silver, and then the third servant he gives one bag of silver. And Jesus actually shared this parable to teach us about the importance of stewarding our talents well. In the parable, the master entrusts his servants with the talents according to their ability. So if you notice, each servant had a different amount of talent that they were given. And so the first two servants, the master leaves, goes on his trip, the first two servants actually invest and multiply their talents and they receive praise and reward when the master returns. And then the third servant actually buried his talent out of fear, resulting in disappointment and consequences from his master. Have any of you ever felt nervous or uncomfortable or scared and you didn't do something with maybe an ability you had or grow something because you just felt the fear? By a show of hands, have any of you ever felt like that? Yeah, so I'm raising my hand as well because I've definitely felt that way. And this parable just reminds us of the rewards that come from using our talents generously and the consequences if we neglect them. And so the third servant knew what he had been given to him was from his master and did not belong to him. So he felt that he couldn't really do anything with that one bag of silver that his master had given to him because he felt his master already had all the stuff that what, what difference was it gonna make if he went and invested it and multiplied that? And so that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 25, verse 24. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bible. And it says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. 
See, here is what belongs to you. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate or grow, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. So we see that this third servant had that fear and just buried it and felt like he couldn't really do anything with that. But when we look back at the other two servants, they felt that they could multiply that and further grow that and nurture what they had been given so that they could give that back to their master. And so the main observation that I take from this that I want you all to write down is nurturing talent is greater than natural ability. Nurturing talent is greater than natural ability. And so you might be thinking, what does that mean? I don't really understand that. So if we are gonna nurture our talent, we have to take care of it, we have to grow it. So if I have an apple tree and I want to make it have a lot of fruit or produce a lot of fruit, I'm gonna water it, I'm gonna fertilize it, I'm gonna make sure that it gets the right amount of sun. Naturally, that tree in the wild is also still gonna grow. But imagine how much more fruit it would produce if you nurture that tree. And that's why we have to, nurturing talent is greater than our natural ability. And we have the reasons for being generous with our talents. God has already given us these talents as gifts. So we have to also remember that what's been given to us is not ultimately ours, it's God's. And we are called to be good stewards of these gifts, using them to bring glory to him. Our talents have the power to bless and serve others, and when we generously share our talents, we inspire and and encourage others to do the same. By using our talents for his glory, we align ourselves with his kingdom work. And now you might be thinking, there might be, it might be uncomfortable. Maybe you have an ability or you have a talent that you haven't really tried to grow or nurture. And so we have to remember that trusting in God's provision and guidance can help us overcome fear and step out in faith. For me, when I first joined North Students as a leader, I actually did not wanna join as a leader. I felt like I was not qualified for the job. I felt that I wasn't reading my Bible enough. I didn't have a close enough relationship with Christ. And so I just felt that I couldn't lead anyone else to him. But because I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, I stepped out in that faith and reminded myself, it's not about me, but it's about him. I also had to tell myself that if I keep what I already know about Jesus from, from everyone or from leading others, that I'm not growing that or nurturing that. Yes, I know that, but it was better than not telling others anything about him. So I had to remember that God has uniquely equipped me and it helped me dismiss those feelings of insecurity. And we also have to remember that. Embracing a sense of urgency with our talents can help us overcome contentment and pursue generosity. If we think about that video that we just watched, those kids could have thought, oh, well, my one can of food isn't gonna make a big difference. But when they all got together, they multiplied what they had and they were able to make abundance and give to the shelter, the food. So we have to also remember to create a culture of community and support that can help us overcome comparison and self-doubt. When we're doing it with others, it makes it that much easier to share and grow our talents. And I wanna leave you all with some practical steps to develop generosity. So they're gonna be up on the screen. The first one is what you enjoy and others see. And what I mean by this is reflect on what you enjoy doing already. What talents do you already enjoy doing? What activities do you already enjoy doing? And what do others see in you? Other people were telling me that, oh, you would be such a great leader. Oh, you would be great at this. But in my mind, I was thinking, I can't do that. But because people kept encouraging me, it helped me to see the potential that I could have by being a leader. The second one is prayer. We have to spend time in prayer asking God to reveal how how you can best use your talents. 
And so God already knows what your talents are. He knows your ability. So pray and ask him what that is for you. What can you nurture and grow? The third one is serve others. We have to seek out opportunities to serve and bless others with our talents or with your talents. And the fourth is encourage others. So be an encouragement and support for others in discovering and using their talents. Again, it goes back to if people weren't encouraging me, I probably wouldn't be up here right now. So you also have to encourage others. Once you've got, asked God what it is he wants you to do in your life with your talents, then you have, are better equipped to encourage others to do the same. So you have to think about this. How would your life look different by doing these steps, by taking these four practical steps? Think about how much more the kingdom can grow by you sharing your talents and being generous with those talents. And think about how maybe your community could change, the North Students Ministry could change, your school could change, your family could change by being generous with your abilities and your talents. Thank you so much, and I want you guys to stand up and put your hands together for another one of your North Students leaders, Dawson Hurt. <laughs> What's up, guys? If you didn't catch my name, my name's Dawson. Uh, Dawson Hurt. I am one of the ninth grade boys leaders. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk. Uh, like Jarrah and Sawyer both brought up, just beautiful to see all the giving that's happening this month and, and all the, you know, bake sales and taco lines and things out in the lobby. Um, it's really beautiful to see. And Sawyer approached me and asked if I wanted to talk about uh, being generous with your time and, and what time is and, and what that looks like. And I started thinking about, I love movies, so I started thinking about movies that involve time. And there's a lot, you know, you have... Terminator and Groundhog Day and Back to the Future, all these things with like time travel, Avengers Endgame. I just finished watching Loki, which is really good. Um, but there's one movie I kept coming back to, um, and it's a lesser known movie called In Time with Justin Timberlake that came out in 2011, uh, which is older than some of you, which makes me feel very old. Uh, but we, I think we have a poster. Yeah, we have this poster here. This is from the movie. It's called In Time. It's a sci fi movie, and in this movie, Everybody ages to 25 years old, and then at 25 years old, a clock pops up on your arm, that kind of green band right there. There's this clock that pops up with a year, and it starts to tick down. And you work at your job, and rather than getting dollars or money, you increase the time on your clock. And once that clock tick clicks to zero, you die, and that's it. So it's a little bit different than the real world, and it's this fascinating idea of, of the value of time and how we value our time and how we work to, to increase that value. But there's some differences with this movie and in real life, right? Because in real life, we can increase kind of your monetary hourly wage. I make more per hour than I did when I was 16. But the time that we have is finite. We cannot gain more time. We can only gain the money that we make in that time. The other thing about the time about the differences in real life is that we don't know how much time we have. We just don't, that's just the reality of life. It'd be as if I logged into my bank account info, info and I looked at my bank account and it just had a shrug emoji. It was like, I don't know, but it's going down. I don't know, but it's, it's going down. And it's like, oh, okay. So the, like the movie, but even more so in real life, time is the most valuable resource that we have. It's finite, it's going down, we don't know how much time we have. It's the only thing that each of us have equal value. We all have time, and we all have the ability to use it how we see fit, and the best way we can use our time. Yeah. And Jesus knows this. So Jesus, the first thing that Jesus asks of us is for our time. And he says this to all of his disciples. That's the first thing he asks of all of his disciples. If you go to look at Peter and Andrew, or uh, James and John, or Matthew, 
the first thing he asks them is to follow me. That's the first thing he says to his disciples. So we'll look specifically at the calling of Matthew. In Matthew 9, 9, I think we have it up on the screen. We have, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, as I said, Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew had a lot of money. Tax collectors have a lot of money. They get a lot of money from uh, the way that they collect taxes. They were some of the richest people in that culture. But Jesus doesn't ask Matthew for his money. He asks him for his time. Tax collectors also were friends with the Romans. They worked for the Romans. Matthew was, Jew, was Jewish, but he worked for the Romans. Jesus could have asked Matthew for his influence with the Romans, asked for some Roman uh, protection, something like that, because he knew Jesus, Jesus knew he was going to anger a lot of people. He was going to make some enemies. He could have asked Matthew for maybe some influence with the Romans, maybe a little bit of help from the Romans, but he doesn't. He asks Matthew for his time. Yep. And the, t- the 12 begin to learn about this value of Jesus and what Jesus has to offer. In John 6, we have, um, we have John 6, 68 to 69. It's Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Verse 69, he continues and said, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So they learn that what Jesus offers is so much more valuable than our time. Even um, Paul learns this too. Paul learns this in Philippians 3.8. I don't have it up on the screen, but in Philippians 3.8, Paul says, for I count everything else as worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ. He says it's garbage. Everything else is pointless except for the infinite value of Jesus Christ. So what Jesus offers is eternal and is so much more valuable than our time, which is temporary. So now what do we do with our time? Because there's a lot of things we can do with our time. We can say, I can be up here and say, be generous with your time, give it to God. But what does that mean? There's a lot of different things we can do with our time. And I'm gonna give you a tough answer to that question. It depends. It depends. And unfortunately, that's a common answer in our world. Because there's a lot of context, there's a lot of issues. I say that answer in my job quite a bit. I'm a graphic designer, all the clients say, hey, is this a good direction to go? And I'll say, well, it depends. Who are, who is your targeting? What is your business trying to do? What are you trying to do with this certain idea? But in this case, it depends because it's gonna look different depending on where you are, what God's calling you to, and how you're living your life, the season of life that you're in. It even depends on the day sometimes. JC, not too long ago, stood up here and talked about the Sabbath. How you spend your time on the Sabbath is gonna look different than how you spend the time the rest of the week, right? Right? So I'm gonna look at two ways that we can give our time to God. There are two broad ways that we give our time to God. In your small groups, I want you to to go into each one and look into specifics for your life um, and how you're gonna give those ways to God. So we're gonna look at two ways. First, we're gonna look at, at staying, and second, we're gonna look at going. So for the first way, we're gonna look at Luke 10. Jesus is, getting, is going uh, to have dinner with two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, um, they invite him over. They invite him to, to come and have dinner with them. And Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's sitting there, she's listening. She's trying to soak in as much of Jesus as possible. Meanwhile, Martha's in the kitchen making preparations. They're about to have dinner, so she's cleaning, she's making dinner, she's doing all these really, really good things. You know, and, and that takes a lot, a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to cook. Yeah. Thanksgiving is coming up. Please help your family in the kitchen. <laughs> it will go a long way. So she's doing all these things, and, and she realizes that her sister is sitting there not helping her. And so what she does is she goes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, can you tell my sister to come help me? I'm trying to do all these things for, for this dinner that we invited you to, and she's not helping me. And Jesus corrects her, and he goes, um, but Jesus corrects her, and he, as he says, only one thing is needed, and it's him. 
He's saying, you're worried about all these things, all these good things, but only thing you need is me. It's good to do the cleaning, it's good to do the cooking, but it is easy to get distracted with those good things and forget about God. So he, she, he corrects her in that. And, I, when I, when I, and this is so important to my story too, because when I became deliberate in my time with God, yeah. everything changed. Yeah. And that's not just creating a schedule or, or just reading my Bible, but, but really being deliberate in that time with God and, and journaling well and, and, and praying well and, and being deliberate when I read the Bible. But then we look, at, we look at the second part. Because I was doing the second part. I was leading Bible studies, I was doing ministry, but it was, it was the first part that changed, changed everything. So now we look at, at our other way to give, and that's to go. So in Matthew 28, Jesus tells his disciples to go. It's called the Great Commission. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the best part is, for I'm with you to the end of the age. When I say to stay and to go, it doesn't mean stay with God and then go and leave God. No, Jesus says, I've built a path and I will walk beside you with it as you go. Right? So go and make disciples. But I want to add one caveat here that I really like. The, the better de- uh, translation I've heard of this verse is not go and make disciples, but it is as you are going, make disciples, right? When we hear, go and make disciples, we go, okay, well, I got school at this time, and then I got church on Wednesday night, I got band practice here, I got basketball practice here. Okay, maybe I can squeeze my go right here for like an hour, wow. right? But that's not what this says. It says, as you were going. So as I'm going to school, as I'm going to band practice, as I'm going to basketball practice, as I go home, as I hang out with my friends, I'm making disciples, and I'm being generous with my time in those places, to give to God and to bring glory to God. I had a, a mentor in uh, college, and he would always phrase it like this. If the cause is worthy, the cost is irrelevant. If Jesus is worthy, then the cost of your time, your talents, your money, your reputation, fill in the blank, is irrelevant and Jesus is worthy. So I'll leave you with a final thought. In your head, heart, and actions, is God worth your most valuable resource? In your head, in your thoughts, and what you're thinking, in your heart, and what you truly believe, and in your actions, when you go out to your life and exit these doors, and you go home, and you hang out with your friends, and you go to school, are those showing that the most valuable thing in your life is God? And are you giving up your most valuable resource to him? I'm gonna pray. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for for the incredible generosity of these students and and, and the the blessings that that you've given to us. I, I pray that you will use you know, our, our gifts and our talents and our time and you will multiply them so much beyond that we can even imagine. Lord, I thank you for all that you've given us. I thank you for your example of giving, your example of generosity, and that you will walk with us no matter what. That you will walk with us as we exit these doors, that you will walk with us as we go into our, our lives and our schools and our jobs. I thank you that you give us hearts of generosity, and I pray that we will live that out in every step of our lives. In Jesus' name pray, amen.